Hi guys. Um, today I'd like to start talking a little bit about using um, what's called a dichotomous key. I, 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 let me let me write this for you because I want you to understand. Oh, let me get a black one here. A dichotomous key. Di means two, and dichotomous means choices. This key is a tool that you can use to identify many, many, many different things. There is a plethora, a whole bunch of keys out there called dichotomous keys. And what they do is they give you choices on, on identification of any particular set of things. It can be something like different kinds of rocks. It can be trees. It can be um, all different kinds of things. We're going to focus on marine organisms. So a dichotomous key, what it does is it gives you these two choices. And, and so what happens is you have a pair of choices. And it'll be labeled one and it'll have some information and then another one it'll have some information and it'll tell you to go to somewhere else some other choice this this pair is called a couplet and the way that this works um i'm gonna let me is really illustrated nicely in this book written by actually by a friend of mine Dr. Mickey Weiss um, his real name is Howard and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this book to help you to understand about this keys this is one key on marine animals of southern New England and New York and um, Dr. Weiss, Mickey Weiss wrote this book with the help of some grad students and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you how this works. I have given you a copy of the parts of it. So let me, let me, let me go here. Okay, so what I'd like to kind of highlight here is that, well, let me, let me fix this here. There are a series of chapters, and the way that this works, the way that this works is that each chapter is a different group. And so, if you look here, the first thing, and I gave you copies of, of um, the getting started part that helps us to understand about keys, and we're going to go through that a little bit together. But if you notice, 3.0 to 3.05 are all sponges. 4.0 to 4.15 are nidarians. Those are the jellyfish and the hydroids and things like that. And so different chapters have different groups of organisms. I've given you most of the mollusks, which are the clams and the snails and things, because we're going to use those as, a, um, as an example of keys Plus, we're going to be covering these things, so I thought it would be a good time to kind of identify some. So let me turn to a page that I've given you. The first page that I've given you is this page here. And what I want to do is I want to highlight this little, this little example of a key here. So it's coming. So it, if you read here, it says a key requires the user to make a series of decisions which, if made correctly, lead to the identification of the organism. Usually each decision involves a choice between two alternatives called a couplet. Occasionally they'll have more than two, um, and so we'll just kind of deal with those. That, that's just the, the nature of the way that this thing works. So what I have here is I have, everybody's familiar with this coin that I just put here, okay? But here is a really good key on identification of coins. Now, I, 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 this book was written before the, the, the state quarters came out. 
So we'll just have to deal with it without thinking about the state quarters. But here's a really good way to look at this, this thing. Here's a really good example of a key. And so you'll see that there's two number ones, two number twos, two number threes, two number fours. And by the time you're done, you have identified whatever you're looking to identify. Okay, so keys to different coins dated after 1965. Okay, so here's two choices. The coin is copper brown in color or the coin is silver in color. Well, if you look at this coin here, it's silver in color. So it tells you that you have to go to number two. So we're going to go from here to the number two. Number two says one side of the coin displays an eagle and neither side of the coin displays an eagle. So what you have to do now is again make the choice and do you see an eagle here? I don't. So let's flip it over and we'll see on the other side is there an eagle on that side? And the answer is no. So neither side of the coin displays an eagle it tells you to go to number four. So we're going to take and go to number four. And it says the word liberty appears behind the head on one side of the coin. Does liberty appear behind the head? Or the word liberty appears in front of the head. So here's liberty. If you look right here is liberty. And here's the head. So the word liberty appears in front of the head. That means that we've identified this coin as a dime. Okay. Now, there's a couple of really important points to consider here. First thing you need to do is you, you have to understand terminology. So when we, let me, let me zoom back out of here a little bit. When we look at, at the way that this works, I'm just going to go to one of the pages that I've given you. Um, so if we look at, at these pages, the nice thing about what, what Mickey has done for us, what Dr. Weiss has done for us, is he's given up, and again, you have these in the, in the, uh, let me fix it here. You have these in the, the document that I sent you, but if you look, Okay, if you look, these these I, these pictures help you to understand the terminology. If you don't know what a spire is, it's really hard to use the key. If you don't know what an umbilicus is, it's really hard to use the key. So just just for just for the sake of argument, um, if I look at if I look at this shell you can see that this hole right here is the umbilicus, okay? But you need to know what an umbilicus is to use this key. So I thought what we would do is, and, and you have all the pages that you need to do this, I thought what we would do is we start out with the page here, and I'm really going to kind of, I'm really gonna oh, let me see if I can do this right. I'm really gonna use the key here and I'd like you to kind of keep track of how we get here. So so if you start on 2.00, it gives us a really good key for identifying things if you don't know what they are. If you know what they are, then you can go right to the pages that you know. Okay? Uh, when we do our mollusks, if you go to 7.00, that's mollusca, and it'll tell you right away. But just to kind of use this key a little bit, I have a shell here, and I want to know what this shell is. Okay? It's really common. If we get to go to ham and acid together, I'll show you these growing on on the rocks. Okay? But, but this shell is, I want to know what it is. Okay? So here's what here's how we do this key. Um, if you look at your document, or if you can follow along with what I'm doing here, okay, 
It says microscopic inside microscopic sized plants and animals less than two millimeters long, less than a sixteenth, that's a little tiny thing, or individuals or colonies larger than a sixteenth of an inch. Well, this is larger than a sixteenth of an inch. So it says it is macrofauna and macroflora go to three. So we're gonna go one to three. So there's two choices. Animals that can move about by swimming, and they give you pictures of what they're talking about. So if you look here, you can see here's swimmers. Okay, figure A is swimmers. Um, figure B floating, and they show you floaters. Okay, and so on. But we're going to move along here for the sake of argument. So um, let me clear this. So animals that can move about by swimming, floating, walking, flying, crawling, like snails, starfish, sea urchins, and etc., burrowing, or and any animal in the mud or the sand, animals with fins, legs, wings, two feet, muscular foot, or other structures used in locomotion, or all plants and sessile animals. Sessile means doesn't move. Okay, animals that, that attach firmly to one spot on rocks, piling seaweed, eelgrass, shells, etc., and parasites. So this shell is from an animal that had a muscular foot. Okay, it moves about by crawling. You guys have seen Gary and SpongeBob, right? So he's this is kind of like Gary and SpongeBob. So it's a modal animal, and it says go to page two twelve. So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to turn to page 212, and again, you have this in your um, in your packet in your in your download in in classroom. So let's go through this one here. It says with legs or without legs might may have other structures used for locomotion such as fins, tentacles, flippers, a muscular foot. And this guy has a muscular foot okay so with legs or without legs and then it has all these other choices so this choice says go to number two so we got to go to two with arms or tentacles this does not have arms or tentacles so it says without any arms or tentacles we're gonna go to three I'm sorry we're gonna go to yeah uh, let's see. nope we're gonna go to number five Okay, so five says, five says, oops, let me focus this a little bit. Five says, with numerous long spines attached to a somewhat spherical shell or tiny fuzz-like spines attached to a flat disc-shaped shell or without numerous spines and so this doesn't have spines when they're talking about spines if you look they're talking about and they show you these are animals with spines so sea stars brittle stars sea urchins those things have spines that's not what we're talking about so let me refocus this a little bit so it says without numerous spines so we're going to go to six Six says, enclosed in one or more shells with a, with a muscular foot used to creep, burrow very slowly or on or into the substrate. Snail-like. Ooh, sounds like what we've got, right? Clam-like, limpet-like animals. Now, here's the key. We always read both choices. If you read both choices, you can then make the decision. Sometimes the choices are pretty close, so you have to kind of say, well, is it this one or this one? So the other one says soft-bodied animals not enclosed in a shell or hard case. Well, we know that ours is, so it says mollusks, page 210. So then I have to go back a page to mollusks, page 210. Okay? Now, now, it says here, branched and jointed, or not branched this doesn't have any branches right so we're gonna go to number two so we went one to two with numerous spines nope without numerous long or short spines and that's it 
so we're going to go to three. Shell is a single piece. Shell is not made of more than one plate or valve. Another name for the shell is a valve, right? Shells may or may not have a shelf on the underside. Go to four. Or uh, halves can be seen if examined carefully. Well, our shell is is not is made up of one single piece, so we're going to go to number four. Shell is coiled, snail-like. Ooh, look at that. See how it's coiled? See how it's spirally? If you look here, see how it's spirally, right? Hold on, let me see if I can erase this. Okay, that worked. Okay. So shell is coiled and snail like, go to number five. Look at this, we're just going right down the list here. Right? So one to two to three to four to five. Shell is firmly cemented to eelgrass, algae, or other substrate and cannot move around when alive and undisturbed, a crown of Feather-like tentacles may extend from the opening. Uh, shell is tiny, never larger than one sixteenth of an inch in diameter. Shell is white, and that would be spirorbis, or the coiled worms. We're, it's not that, but we'll look here. A single pair of, let's see. So the second five says, animal grips substrate by means of a muscular fleshy foot and can move about by means of slow creeping motion. When the animal is alive and undisturbed, a single pair of tentacles, a proboscis, and a muscular foot may extend from the opening of the shell. Shell may be larger than a sixteenth inch in diameter. Shell may or may not be white. Well, it's not definitely not white, but it certainly fits that description. So, so the we're going to pick the second one of five, and it says to go to page seven o two. It's a kind of snail. That makes sense. You guys look at this, and you could know that it's a snail, right? So we're going to go to page 702. So I'm going to go to 7.02. And again, you have 7.02 in your, in the down, in the, the classroom. Okay. So here we go. Again, you have to look at your, at your packet because I'm going to kind of zip through this because I don't want to bore you, but I want to make sure you get how to do this. So it's just a series of choices that if you make the right choices, you end up identifying the animal correctly. Let's see if I can. There we go. Okay. So it says, Bottom of the shell has a siphonal canal or a siphonal notch. What the heck is that? Well, if you look right here, see this little canal? That's what they're talking about. They're talking about they're talking about this little um, extension here with a little hole-like thing in it, and at the back end is a groove is a, a notch okay so they're saying does it have this siphonal canal or notch a and if you look at this it doesn't seem to have something like that okay so it says bottom of the shell is round without a siphonal canal or notch and and that's what it looks like so we're going to go to five so we're going one to five right shell Round shell with circular or D-shaped openings. Can you guys see that? Th Let me turn it this way. So you can see that this is a D-shaped opening. Right? So, uh, or cone-shaped, egg-shaped, or cylindrical shells. So this has that D-shaped opening, and so... Um, Let's see. We're going to go to number six. It says, with an umbilicus, a small hole, which we don't have. If you look at this, we don't have that small hole, right? Um, near the inner lip with a D-shaped opening and operculum plate 
often grows larger than an inch and a quarter. This is not an inch and a quarter, right? Um, let me focus this a little bit. Okay, or um, cone-shaped, egg-shaped, uh, I'm sorry, without an umbilicus or callus, with a circular or teardrop-shaped opening and operculum plate, and that's what we are. So we, it, this is telling us it is a kind of periwinkle. You see how we're going from one, uh, from one choice to the next based on where it tells us to go in the, in the key. Okay, so let me just, we just have a few more, let's, okay, so periwinkles, and then it tells you periwinkles are on page 7.05. Again, you do have this, but we're going to go to the periwinkle page. So now it says, spire, very flat and low, top of shell is round. So if you look at this shell, oh, let me, there we go. Does it look like this? Does it look flat like this? No. Raised spire, top of shell comes to a sharper rounded point. I would say that's a sharp point, right? So we're going to go to number two. So we're going to go one to two. Uh, sutures are deep and distinct. Shell has a, le a terraced appearance, never grows larger than 5 eighths of an inch long, 1.6 centimeters. Or sutures are very shallow, so there's little or no indentation between the whorls. Grows up to 1 and a quarter inches long. The most common periwinkle on the rocky shore. So what they're saying is, do you see deep grooves in this, like this? Or is it more smooth and shallow like this. I would say it's smooth and shallow. So sutures are sh very shallow, so there's little or no, and it tells you that our critter that we're looking at is Litterina litteria, the common periwinkle, and there's the information about it. So I hope that helps you to understand how to use a dichotomous key. Um, we will be using these keys a lot. Um, and, and if we make it to Hammond Asset, which I hope we do, we will be using these keys to identify a number of critters on the, on the, the coastline of, of Connecticut and, and New England. So um, that's what I wanted to show you about dichotomous keys. Thank you so much. I hope you got a lot out of this.